thing is to be moved, to love, to hope, to tremble, to live. August Rodin This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Stephen Walker captures the essence of the impressions of a long meditative walk along the back alley street of a small town or down a quiet rural road. His paintings often capture the warm light of the golden hour just after sunrise or just before sunset. Long shadows and warm glowing light arrest the eye in a narrative to be completed by the viewer. And then, as the sun sets and street lights flicker on, Stephen shifts to painting moody nocturnes that invoke feelings of a quieter time. His paintings are imbued with rich color, evocative light and shadow, and tantalizing design and composition that lures a viewer within his painting. Stephen says he discovered his love for art at an early age. After earning a bachelor and master's degree, he began the arduous road to becoming a professional fine art painter. He began painting full time at what may have seemed to be the worst possible time, and that was during the dismal economic aftermath of the mortgage industry meltdown of 2008. Undeterred and with the loving support of his wife, he threw himself into painting, continually honing his skills as a painter. The result of his hard work includes winning many awards and having extensive gallery representation over the years. His determination to grow as an artist shows in the maturity of his work. Stephen Walker's paintings are a reflection not only of his skill in painting though, but also reflects his artistic poetry expressed with transparency and light. My name is Carl Olson and this is The Artful Painter. Well, Stephen, it's great to have you here on The Artful Painter today. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Good to be here. Just a little backgrounder. The way I found out about you is through uh, another artist, another Georgia artist. You're from Hayhira, mm -hmm. uh, Georgia, which is way down in South Georgia. Beautiful country there. But uh, it was David Boyd, who lives in yeah. Newnan, a mutual friend, uh, introduced me to your work. And I'm glad he did. I was following David for a couple of years, and then he actually had a show here in, uh, near Valdosta. And I said, let me go and check him out and see, you know, see the work in person and meet him. And uh, we kind of drummed up a friendship uh, from that point on. Very nice. Yeah, he's, he's uh, I, I, I've, I visited his studio shortly before the pandemic shut down my travel. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous of his studio. Oh, my goodness. You went down in the basement there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the gallery is great, but the basement is the man cave. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> he had uh, artist who was it? Oh, Bill Farnsworth did a demo. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so I, I went and watched that. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Newnan's just one of those classic rural uh, towns it in Georgia. It is. Yeah. I got a lot of uh, just, just driving there to drop off work. I got a lot of reference photos and. Uh, Things, you know, a lot of inspiring uh, pieces that I can work with. Oh, nice. You're not afraid to use photos with paintings? No, not at all. I, I, I rely on photos. I used to be an illustrator. so Really? Wow. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, for about five or six years. Yeah. And that's, that's what I uh, went to school for was illustration. And so mm. I did that for like five or six years and then got kind of sick of working for other folks as far as their uh, assignments and, the, you know, the deadlines got quicker and the pay get, didn't change. So, so, you know, I'm going to do stuff for myself. Well, I, I think artists who have, have gone to school for design and illustration, I think by and large, every single one of them have benefited from that education. It may not have been what they oh, wanted yeah. to do for life, but right. they have benefited from that training. Right, because um, I took a lot of the business aspect from illustration and just applied it to fine art. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you find out from people, other artists that you meet that, you know, you had a, a, a an advantage because 
they didn't get the business side when they went to school for painting. Um, that, that illustration did. So you, you got good business training. I, I just talked to someone not too long ago, and and that was the one thing that was missing in their art education. And they went to school for graphic design as well, but they didn't get the business side of things. I, I was very fortunate um, with my education at, at um, VCU, um, well, Virginia Commonwealth University. Ah, there you go. You got the shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of my instructors were working illustrators so they even had an actual class called called the business of illustration and and often we got to see the either projects or commissions they were working on and you know i would just pick their brain and and figure out you know what i need to do after i got out of school and even then i was still a little lost so they didn't so it wasn't so much that they had classes but you were able to uh, they did. They mentioned? actually did have oh, they one did. class. Okay. It was it was called the business of illustration, and they went over contracts, uh, a lot of contracts, as well as uh, um, copyright issues. You know, a, a lot of things just to keep us from either getting ripped off or getting sued. <laughs> Excellent. That's a good. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that's something we do have to understand. I know before we right. started recording this episode we were talking about copyrights of photographs and and artwork exactly. and yeah sometimes people don't realize that you as an artist when you sell a painting you still retain the copyright to that right. painting not the person that bought it right unless you transfer uh, it to them which would be crazy <laughs> yeah yeah, I, yeah it would yeah that would be crazy I, I couldn't imagine doing that but this was all you know i was in school right around the time that photoshop was coming out and you know, the, the internet was very big, it's, you know, so we um, were kind of in competition with Photoshop, but also we had to learn new laws with the internet. You know, now people just take whatever they want and uh, run with it, which is still crazy to me, but. Well, isn't it true that in advertising, I remember years and years ago, they'd say, have a swipe file. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now, I didn't mean to actually steal, but we were inspired. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we'd keep a catalog of things. Yeah, <laughs> I used to have a big I, file of stuff that I'd cut out and keep, and magazines that I would keep. Yeah, for inspiration. I still have that. I still, I'm still cutting things out and having them on my my inspiration board. And but with that whole copyright issue. I actually had a guy take one of my illustration images off of my website and try to sell it via um, his website as prints. No and way. Yeah, I, I just happened to find out because I'm not even sure how I found out, but he was doing that with a number of artists that were in this particular show in Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, I just send them a quick email like, hey, cease and desist, you know. Right. Um, my initial reaction was just kind of like, that's a bad photo. You know, he didn't even, like you said, he didn't even swipe. <laughs> <laughs> he swipe about, well. I would ask the guy, well, how many have, prints have you actually sold oh, in my image? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah he, didn't sell, he didn't sell any. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, but he also had a number of my friends stuff on there. So I called them and told them, you know, what they should do and so on. Was it nefarious or was it just ignorance? Uh, no, I think it was just complete ignorance because yeah. he just, he, he actually, he didn't take it off my website. It was, a, he took a photo of a painting that I had in a show. Mm. So he just took his camera, took a photo of the painting on the wall and start selling or trying to. Well, I think that's an interesting point because um, I do take a lot of photos of mm -hmm. paintings, you know, people yeah. that I like. Uh, if I go to the Booth Western Art Museum or, or, yeah. or of a gallery a and they allow uh, photos to be taken, I will take them. But that certainly doesn't grant me the right to uh, go out and make prints of right. those photos. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the image quality would be that great for a print. Right. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, the new iPhones 
are just rocking it right now with quality. I just, oh, yeah, man. Crazy. I guess it's going to be something we're going to have to face as artists in the future, you know, people trying to pull that. So Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's just one of those things where you kind of almost have to do a search for yourself every once in a while just to find out what's hanging out there. And I had a friend that had his work stolen um, via Facebook, and this guy was basically made a whole account um, using his images as his own. Oh, wow. You yeah, know, that, really. th this has gotten common, and, I, it, and I'm, I'm pretty skeptical. I, I'm usually extremely cautious on yeah. social media, you know, who is who, because you really don't have 100% uh, guarantee that whoever's behind that account is the person. And right. there's a there's a new scam that's going on. I say it's new. It's been around for some time, but <laughs> it was new to me as I got more involved with social media. Is, and maybe you've seen this happen, but someone will actually create an account that is that person. It looks like yeah. that person, yeah. and then they'll send you a message: "Hey, come like my page," and yep. and the next thing you're you're or they like you. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they send I've had that oh my goodness! And then and uh, and I. I got suckered into that one time and I was so angry because as soon as I did it, they sent me a, uh, a, a direct message. Yep. Yep. And I knew, mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Either trying to <laughs> sell you something or get you to donate to a cause of some sort. Yeah. yeah. It's very common. So just don't click those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and usually we, uh, we we'll try to let the artist know, hey, somebody's spoofing you out there. You know, go check it out. <laughs> exactly. You, yeah. Well, it's it's a shame that we have to operate in that situation. But let's get away from that that negativity. It's good. Yeah, it's please. the good negative. We got to we got to be prepared, right? Shrewd is the one that prepares for calamity. Goes the old proverb, mm. right? So we do have to yes. be careful. <laughs> but I want to talk about your art because that's really what drew me uh, uh, oh, to you. Stuff? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> if you have to, right? So, 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 so here's this is what I think of, and as I I was looking, it reminded me of when I used to go. I still like to do this. I'll go on long walks. Your artwork reminds me of those long walks uh, that I go on. You you're drawing me in to uh, uh, details of the of a moment. In that walk well good that's i mean that's usually how the works come about as far as me either taking a walk or, or or a short drive or either and usually that stems into me going down a road or an alleyway i wouldn't normally go down or i'm oh, not yeah. familiar with but you know even within that i'm looking more so i'm looking at the time of day and and that light that creates those design, you know, design elements as far as shadows and, and how the light's cutting across a building or even a farm or um, just a tree in some cases. I was um, dropping my daughter off at school today, this morning, and, um, you know, she, she, she um, saw me with my phone taking a picture just out of the window as we were parked, um, waiting for them to open, and... Uh, she's like, what are you doing? It's like, sweetheart, look at me is glowing. It's like, yeah, it is. I'm going to paint that. And she's like, really? Yep, I'm going to paint that, sweetie. And uh, so, you know, just being ready for whenever inspiration is around is, is a big part of it. But I'm always on the lookout, even, even when I'm just, you know, parked, waiting to push my daughter out of the car and, go about my day <laughs> <laughs> so those walkabouts are important oh like, absolutely yeah yeah wow so are you, you you're probably the kind of guy then that likes to get in a car and just say no no agenda just drive in one direction and and see what yeah. you see yeah and some but in a lot i mean a lot of cases i've already seen something but it's not the right time of day so mm. i'll I'll just make make a note of it and then go back to that during either for me it's either morning or late afternoon when you know it's either sunset or sunrise. 
Right. So you're looking for that contrast in light. Yeah. And your yeah. and and your paintings are filled with that. You can see exactly. that light in there. E- even that golden hour. I mean, I'm I'm a lot of times looking for nostalgia, and and those things that are commonly passed over, and you know they're not necessarily landmarks of any sort. They're just hey, here's a group of trees that you know kind of reminds me of you know, this relationship between a friend and I or a family member and I and, you know, and go from there. So that's that's interesting to me that you would uh, draw parallels with your own uh, personal experiences and seeing that. Yeah, It, it, it wasn't always that way. You know, initially it was just, oh, that's pretty. Let me paint it. And there Nothing wasn't wrong with much, that. <laughs> there wasn't much uh, substance to it. And, you know, as I was, especially early on, and people were asking me more and more questions and, you know, kind of like, you know, what does this say about you? And I was like, well, I don't know if I'm that kind of artist that, you know, I'm trying to make a statement necessarily. But, you know, there is a reason why I gravitate towards either nature or this sense of light or, you know, these these rundown buildings or, or um you know, my subject matter. So I need to explore that a little bit and figure out, hey, what what is it? And because uh, I years ago, a friend asked me, what makes you happy? And I was so ticked off with him just because I didn't have an answer for him. And I had to think about the last time I was like really happy. And this was back when, you know, I was just a couple of years out of school. And it was when I was in Boy Scouts camping, you know, it was just long weekends camping with, with my fellow troop members and um, goofing off. But it was quiet. It was serene. It, you know, it, it was just different side of life, uh, you know, outside of suburbia or, or, you know, city life. And so, you know, I just kind of kept exploring like what was it so I even went back to some of the campsites and tried to just figure it out country was this at that time? Virginia. Virginia, yeah. Yeah, uh, I grew up in uh, Richmond, Virginia. So I kind of lucked into my art school, number one, but, you know, it's, it's it was a great part of the country where, you know, down here in, in Hey Howard, the leaves really don't change. But there, when fall comes and, and you know, it, you almost get all, all four seasons there so it gives you a lot of material to work with yeah that's isn't virginia is it's more hardwood trees and then yeah. where i live we have a mix of the i'm i'm in the middle belt of georgia just right. before the piedmont uh, drops off and then when you get to south georgia it's all pine country <laughs> yep. yeah yep. which are beautiful <laughs> trees but they just don't change <laughs> that's right <laughs> You, uh, Sometimes I get sick of painting the same green all year round. <laughs> I know. I've been chastised on this show by a few listeners when I complain about that. They say, you shouldn't do that. You should have a positive <laughs> attitude. And all I can think of is Kermit the Frog's song, It Isn't Easy Being Green. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting better at it. You look at you look at uh, our mutual friend, uh, uh, David Boyd, what he paints. Yeah. I mean, you can take a an old rundown gas meter yeah. or electrical meter and turn it into, well, literally yeah. a work of art. <laughs> I mean, he turns he turns junk into gold. Yeah, I suppose you you probably saw. There's one painting he did. Um, it was in he did it in Cartersville. It's just an old alley. Yeah, yeah. It's just a beautiful beautiful painting. But now y- you you do something similar with your paintings. I I I was looking through some of your paintings and there'll be some of the ones that are really interesting to me are like the nocturnes you'll be yeah yeah the there's i love love painting nocturnes 
you know, but that... um, I, I, I get to, well, there's a few things, you know, I don't get bothered as much when I'm looking for reference. Um, you know, in the middle of the day, if I'm taking a photo of this barn, you know, I might have somebody come up to me and ask, like, what are you doing? For some reason, when you're just wandering the streets at night with a camera, no one cares. <laughs> just, and I like to get those, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, with the landscape, I'm gravitated towards light. And so this is more of a man-made light where, you know, the, the light might be blue, the light might be, you know, orange or yellow or whatever. So I get a lot of different effects. I love those um, nocturne, nocturnes. Mm -hmm. If I if I get a chance, you know, have downtime, that's usually what I'll I'll paint because they also do, you know, fairly well with competitions. I've, at least I've had very good luck with them. Um, so that's you, always helpful. What do you think that is? Because it's it's not your normal subject matter, um, as well as you know, again, the light. It's it's bringing beauty to something that is nine times out of 10 passed over just, you know, you've, you've probably driven past this garage that, you know, looks abandoned or uh, dilapidated and I'll put a spin on it that will, will make it not so creepy or disturbing. It, it's just, it's life. I, I, I'm drawn to, to nocturnes. I, I haven't, I haven't painted one yet. I may try it. I may I may have to give it yeah. a try. I mean, I do a, I do a lot of experimenting, and mm -hmm. and you know, even to this day, I take workshops from other artists. I feel like, you know, if you think that you've kind of peaked and you've learned all you can, then you're in trouble. Oh yeah. So so really, learning is a process that we never stop. Right. I mean, we know I. I personally just don't think we ever should stop. You don't grow anymore. And I've seen that happen with a lot of older artists, um, even some of my classmates who have just kind of learned one way of doing things and stuck to it. And they, they do do it well, but people get bored with, with the same tricks or, or the same presentation or, or formula, I should even say. Yeah, that's that's true, and sometimes it may be I don't know demand driven. They're successful oh, at selling a particular oh, style or or something, and I totally get that because mm -hmm. <laughs> when I um, I lived in Ohio for about ten years, and during that time, you know, I would travel out on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio, and you know, it's a lot of cows and things. I started painting cows, and I was. They were just selling. I mean, I they weren't even good in some cases, but they would sell. And you can get really locked into just, well, they, they keep selling, so I better just keep doing them. And um, I got bored as well as a little frustrated, so I didn't want to be the cow guy. So I just stopped, stopped doing them, moved on to something else. And you, you know, you can you can paint what sells, or you can paint what moves moves your heart and maybe that right. will sell too i think and usually usually that does i mean yeah. i try i've tried to kind of follow other artists path as far as painting what they paint because they were successful and you really could tell that i just wasn't having any fun doing it or it just didn't have the same feeling or or passion behind it and you know i never thought when i guess when i was in school i never thought i'd even be talking this way as far as passion or movement i just thought oh it's a picture just paint it so how did you discover or evolve in the way you felt about that going from you know a mechanical rendering of a particular subject mm -hmm. to something that that actually moved you it, well there, i mean it's there there were a few events that happened which one was i went to this um, workshop called the illustration academy and I met a guy named John English, who is, his uh, dad is Mark English, who's like the grandfather of illustration. And yes, he, indeed. John English started painting landscapes. He got away from illustration. And, you know, I saw something different that I hadn't seen before, because 
at the same time, I was also working at a frame shop, which really motivated me to paint because I saw a lot of bad artwork come through there. I guess the logic was, well, these people are buying bad stuff, then, you know, they're bound to buy my stuff. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, so I saw so much bad artwork coming through that, it, you know, I was motivated to paint better, but I was also discouraged from painting landscapes because I just saw kind of the same field of flowers, prairies, you know, things like that. Nothing that, that really spoke to me. It looked like it was kind of just mass produced and in and, an and assembly line to, sort of way. And then I met John English, and, you know, he was painting uh, landscapes, but they were a little bit different. They had different vantage points. Um, you know, he was, he was being a lot more loose with color and, and the experimentation of color. And that, that was very encouraging to know that, okay, I don't have to stick with illustration just because that was the major that I graduated with. Or, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. That is uh, an, an interesting thing, because I, I noticed even in your artwork, your, your, the, the, the way you compose things is very interesting. I, there's one, for example, that immediately um, hit my eye. It's called yeah. Recline by the Fire. <laughs> I love that one. That oh. one is amazing. Uh, <laughs> it really... You push the envelope on on uh, composition. I'm not, yeah. you know. I, I laid on the floor. Did you really? Oh, yeah. I laid on the floor. Um, and, and we had this wonderful chair that my wife um, sat in almost every day while she was pregnant with my daughter. And, you know, it was Ohio. So it got cold and we, you know, have a fire on. And I love the hardwoods that we had at the time. And. You know, and I also, it was just something I always wanted to paint, and I didn't know why. And so I did it for a demo at, at one of the galleries I'm represented by, uh, out, out in Tulsa, Lovett's Gallery. I did it, they asked me to do a demo there for a show I was having. And so that's what I painted. So did so, so did you take a, a a photo as a reference yeah. for that? And then yeah. did the demo? Oh, wow. Yep. You know, it yeah. reminds me of a photographer uh, I knew. Uh, it's, been, it's probably been at least 10 years since I spoke with him, but his name is uh, Art Howard. And that was one of the things that he mentioned is, is show the viewer something that they normally wouldn't think of uh, of seeing. Right. Give them a different perspective. And so when I saw your this this painting, I said, oh, that's it. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hardwood floor is a predominant part of the foreground of this image. And then your eye is drawn at the very upper right hand side, with the gleam of the chrome and uh, and and the reflection of light on the on the chair. And then you see a just a bit, just a hint of the fireplace. Yeah, uh, yeah. And no, no rule, always, no rule of thirds in this one here. <laughs> no, no, I I ignore all that stuff. Luckily, I, I didn't learn with those, so I, I just go based on instinct and. Um, you know, I, I, I like to take things as if I'm making a movie. So I'm looking at, you know, you know, if something's in my in my way, I'm going to use that to create more depth as opposed to just clearing out, you know, a, a, a scene, you know, because I think in some cases there's, you know, they're telephone poles in a way, but they actually help to create depth or, you know, the grass, if you get low enough, the grass is so, uh, busy and, and tall that you get that parallax. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from cinematographers uh, oh, yeah. with, with uh, painting composition. I look at them and um, David and uh, David Boyd. Now we're talking about concept artists and uh, you know, I, I've been looking at them a lot lately and, and even those that are doing concept art for animation you know, when my daughter and I are watching a movie, you know, I'm watching it with her, but I'm not, we're not looking at the same thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's looking at the dress that the, the, the lady, you know, the princess is wearing. And I'm looking at, how's that glimmer? How's that? Uh, that's, that's an interesting angle. You know, <laughs> well, see, that's the problem with, with the creator, right? We have, yeah, no problem. Never we don't look, and we don't look at things the same way that, uh, that, no. 
uh, mere mortals. I hate to use that expression because well, yeah. no, <laughs> no, it makes us sound like we're superior and we're not in any way. <laughs> we just look at things differently. <laughs> I get I get so many questions. The the I guess the one biggest question I often get is, "You're going to paint that?" When they see my reference photo, and yeah. they're just thinking. There's nothing there. I'm like, oh my goodness, you don't see what I see then. Yeah, we we recently, uh, I recently spoke with Alex Hillkurtz. He's a watercolorist, but he makes a living uh, doing storyboard art. Yeah. And uh, one of the books he recommended was was the series by Joe Johnston, who was the storyboard artist for uh, Star Wars. And you can Ooh. just see the the mastery of perspective and right. and the different right. angles there. Yeah. <laughs> I guess most of my reference books are not other painters or other landscape artists. A lot of them are, you know, graphic novels, storyboarding, concept art, you know, just just pushing to be more creative and dynamic than everybody else that is, I guess, uh, just started as painting and are taking those basic rules, like you said, like the rule of thirds and um, all these other things. I just absolutely destroyed them. I, they, they don't matter to me. sell your work primarily through gallery representation for the most part yeah um but this year it's just been obviously different just ridiculously different where a lot of the galleries have had to pivot and try to figure out what's the best way for them to still operate some have just kind of folded as far as you know trying anything new others don't you know it's where the owners don't necessarily need to, they're independently wealthy, so they don't necessarily need to go they're, above and beyond. They're um, not worried so about it, paying the rent. And, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, I've always put it on myself anyway to just do as much as possible to help them help me. But at the same time, I'm just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like depending on anybody else to basically manage my life. So, you know, I've been doing more as far as through my website and, and sales directly while still keeping those relationships with the galleries open. What do you do for the galleries? What do you do to help them uh, market you? Um, I, you know, I often call them, well, not often. I don't, I don't like to call them too often, but, you know, I'll check in with them every month or, or every few weeks just to see what is working for them, what they need from me. You know, I'll, I'll send them an updated CV or resume. I'll, I, I've sent all the galleries one of my books that has, has it's like a coffee table book that has a, a lot of my work in it. So that helps um, some of their clients see what other works I've done. This is interesting to me. And, and I did see this on your website. Mm -hmm. So, you publish, you self-publish a book about your work. Yes. What's that experience like, and is it worth it to do? It was, the experience was much easier than it probably will be for most people, <laughs> because my <laughs> wife designed it. Ah. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the in-house illustrator. She's the in-house graphic designer. And so... Um, you know, she was, she was much more, she's very patient, obviously, if she's married to me, but. Mine um, too, yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really tough trying to narrow down what pieces you want to have, like, almost like in stone uh, to represent you, you know, among so many people that may buy your, your book. 
Um, so there was a lot of, hey, sweetie, I need to change this one out. No, no, I like this one better. Um, no, this doesn't represent me. You know, because she has favorites versus what I like. And, you know, obviously other people have favorites that I might not care for. So <laughs> the, the narrowing down process is the hardest part, just trying to figure out what pieces you want in, in this book for people to see for years to come, you know, and then trying to narrow down, hey, what do I like versus what do people want to see versus what my wife likes? You know, there's all these decisions that have to be made, um, which which can just be a little daunting. But, um, you know, with the, the end product, you know, especially since I, I thought about I thought about this long and hard whether to even do it because it is a big expense. So, yeah, that, I mean, just the, the decision making process is the hardest. Well, it's it's a it's a large book. The the photos of it I I've seen it looks beautiful. Uh, it's nine by twelve inches. That's yeah. a large. That's a good sized book. Ninety six pages. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard cover. Uh, linen yeah, we wanted hard to, cover. We wanted to do it right. Do you mind if I ask you about how how did you go about having it printed? Who did you go with? Actually, um, I got the idea from a really terrific artist who also did the same thing, uh, Michael Dudash. He, we, we were teaching at a workshop in, I think, Ashland, Oregon, and we just started talking and he had, he had some of his books out and I just asked him, you know, who he used. And it was this publishing company, I think that's in, I want to say they're in Minnesota. Uh, and it's really easy website to remember <laughs> bookprinting.com bookprinting.com. Okay. I mean, you can't be much more straightforward than that. You know, they had all these options that I could choose from, you know, what, how, how large the run would be. Um, so it's not know, on demand, all, but you do, you do it in batches. Right. Yeah. Right. Cause I, I had been doing it on demand through like blurb and that was just way too costly. Yeah. That's I, expensive. I, you know, yeah. Yeah. Was the quality okay with blurb? Oh, yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, it, it's kind of up to you as far as whether you have the files big enough for them to print, right. but the quality was fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I had looked into them, and they, they are expensive. Yeah. But I guess on the flip side, the advantage is it's just a, if you want to do a one-off, you can do a one-off. But Right. The demand became more consistent, so said, so let's just, you know, do a run. And it's not a big run. It's like, uh, I think 300. Wow. That's amazing. So, and, and you've seen the benefits of publishing a book in your career. Oh yeah. This is not your first book. No, I did. I did a couple of small blurb books before and, and, you know, years went by and I, obviously things changed as far as the paintings and sure. stuff like that. So I, I made something a little bit more substantial. Well, let's get back to um, your art. I, uh, there's another interesting uh, series that I was very intrigued by. It, it really resonated with me. Um, I was looking on your website, and you have this series of uh, glasses filled yeah. with objects, and you call it, uh -huh. uh, I think, transparency. Is that correct? Yeah. I want to know the story behind that. <laughs> um, okay, so... A few years ago, um, I, I wanted to branch out of doing landscapes just for a little bit. Just, you know, I was kind of in a rut. And so I was trying to basically do something really for myself and to kind of explain, you know, my the inner workings of, of what goes on with me from day to day. And I suffer from depression um, and it's been that way for years. And so it's, you know, there are a lot of ups and downs, but, you know, painting has been pretty consistent for me and I want to do something to express that, but without just being a, basically a Debbie Downer. Yes. Uh, yeah. it, you know, it's hard to talk about that without people either feeling. I know there's, there's this, uh, no, I don't want to hear this, you know, yeah, yeah, and, exactly. but it's, it's, exactly. it's so real. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it's hard to, and it's really hard to present that to galleries to mm-hmm. say, "Hey, I want to do this series," you know, about my depression. As soon as they hear that, it's kind of like, oh, I don't know yeah. about, I don't know about that. Um, but I, I, I decide to put a twist on it and focus these glasses on the good, the good parts, the good aspects of my life and the good memories as opposed to the negative, because, you know, for anybody that's going through depression, it's really easy to go towards the negative. It's harder to figure out, okay, what do I have going for myself? And so that's what I, that's what I did. And, you know, anytime I had a good, good thought, I would just write it down and the decision to put it, make these more so still lifes and within glasses was that, I'm not sure how it came about, but just this sense, I think depression has been described to me in in several, several times in a sense of drowning. I wanted to put them in a glass, put these thoughts in the glass, because a lot of times when you're in that bad moment, you forget the good, the good times. And so I had to, you know, figure out, okay, what, how am I going to be able to put these memories into a glass without it being overly complex or obviously depressing. So I just started collecting little trinkets from either my past or uh, current that represented what I was going through, even to the point where like some of it was, were, were uh, like comic books and, and pages I ripped out of, of um, books and just balled up and put into a, a glass and, uh, Usually the, the trick was trying to get them to either float or suspend them in a way. And I just came by clear jello. Clear jello. Clear jello. Yep. Get out. <laughs> I would have assumed it was water or something like that, but it was Well water would just I mean, a lot of the objects that I have in there are too heavy. Yeah. For for them to suspend in water, even with ice. And so I, I had to find a way to, you know, or or the water was so, or the object was so fragile that it would just break apart with water. So it would yeah. get soggy, and yeah, yep. So exactly. l- l- let me just try to describe this, and and I'll include I'll include links to these. But each each painting seems to be it's it's a glass. It looks like a glass of mm-hmm. water or milk or lemonade or whatever. Yep. But there's and it sits front and center. It's a still life. It sits front and center on a table. And in it are objects. You know, one has, you know, peppermint candies. And I guess that's what you're, you're talk, talking about because the jello, the paper, peppermint candies stay on the surface there. Right. And others would be like, a, you know, a, 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 a pool ball, a Calvin and Hobbes, uh, yeah. you know, and so forth. <laughs> it's just very, very interesting. We're a little toy car in the glass. Right. So, the, so, so, what does the glass represent? The glass is life, or or just the moment, and the the liquid is the depression mm-hmm. that that a lot of times just engulfs you. I I appreciate you being candid and talking about that. It's not an easy thing to talk about. No problem. I, I mean, know. it's 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 one of my it was one of my goals, like at the beginning of the year, just to be more transparent with people. Mm-hmm. Um, because I found myself teach, you know, you, you start putting on all these hats. Um, you know, I have a gallery, a gallery hat when I have to go to openings. I have a hat for workshops when I'm teaching. I have a home hat. I have an art hat. I have a, you know, with my dog hat, you know. <laughs> and so I just wanted to, to sort of combine, combine those without having to play all these different parts and not feel also just not feeling like I'm being a, a, a fraud or hiding an aspect, you know, because a lot of people need to know this stuff that it's not every day is not just hunky dory. I'm fortunate enough to have a good support system with my wife. Um, you know, like I said, for, for many reasons other than just the depression, she's very mm-hmm. patient. Um, <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, family, you 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 do give credit to your wife. Uh, I noticed, Absolutely. And you, yeah, and and your family. She, she won't take it. <laughs> she'll just she'll just like 
wave it off and say, well, you, you know, you know, I'll tell her, oh, oh, people love your book. And she's like, what do you mean? That's your book. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, can, I did the paintings, but you made it look good. Yeah, you wrote that. You you made me look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so earlier you talked you talked about you took you took work you take workshops. So continuing education is a big part of your your uh, your career as an artist as a professional oh, artist. Yeah. Um, do you anytime also, I'm not happy. Anytime I, you're not I, happy. Yeah, what? if I if I'm really like feeling like I'm I'm getting into a rut or um, just not happy with with the current way the process that I have is going. Mm -hmm. I, I want to explore and see how other people solve problems. I, sometimes I'll just scroll through Instagram or I'll look at my folder of, of um, like paintings and, and photos that I've like printed off and you know just you know, swipe if, if file that we were talking about earlier. Right, right. right. If they're if they're around and they're still teaching, you know. Um, Again, the support system will say, hey, if you need to go take a workshop, go. Obviously, that hasn't happened this year, but, you know, I, I've taken some uh, 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 online classes, which have been just as helpful, you know, obviously just without the travel. So who are some uh, artists that you've taken workshops from that you've benefited from? Uh, the first one, the first major one that I benefited from was uh, Peter Fiore. He's in uh, Pennsylvania, and he used to be an illustrator himself. So that was also why I wanted to take his workshop. A couple of online classes with David Dibble, who's out in Utah. Oh, uh, he's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, some of some of the stuff is just. It's not even, I haven't even taken the workshops, but I've just been able to be around other artists and have like candid conversations and share information. We're, you know, we're, for the most part, most artists are pretty giving as far as and share, you know, willing to share whatever techniques they're doing or using or all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's like a bunch of magicians getting together and just saying, aha, I should see this. Uh, <laughs> This is my rabbit, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've got to agree w with you on that because when I first started this podcast, I wasn't sure how open folks would be. I mean, not not that I was suspicious, but, you know, I just, you know, it is their trade. It is right. their right. Th their way of making a living and, and just wondered how open they would be. But it's it's been astonishing. Everyone has been very open. Personally, um I don't mind sharing information any with with anybody. I actually had a student years ago. I was actually teaching at my alma mater for a little while. And I had a student who asked me, you know, aren't you afraid of us like taking your secrets and, and going off and just stealing them and, and you know making a lot of money from them? And I I just I think he was like eighteen or nineteen. I just looked at him and said, No worried. You're not going to work harder than me. I wasn't trying to be mean or anything like that. It was just, I know, I know me and I know my personality is just, I'm, I'm, I'm painting almost with like a chip on my shoulder just, mm. and I see people running behind me trying to catch up and I just start running even harder. Yeah. You know? Well, I have no delusions that I'll ever catch up with you, Stephen. <laughs> 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 but I'm going to try. I've had a few, you know, I've had a few um, uh, uh, folks that have, have kind of caught up with me and even passed me as far as what I concern, I consider passing me or even be, becoming one of my peers more so. You know, I had an intern uh, who stayed with me for about a year and a half, and she 
worked her butt off around here and helped out. And then we had a show, uh, we were in a show together and she got best in show. And I, I you know, oh, uh, wow. I think one of the directors came and said, your intern just beat you in a show. Are you okay? It's like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was like, come on. I give her a hand. To, I was the first one to go hug her, you know, yeah. and then I whispered and said, I'm going to come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay humble. <laughs> 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 a student is not greater than their master. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the whole, the whole point was just, you know, the point was to make her better and not, yeah. you know, to just give 90% of the information and hold back that, that 10% that's going to get her over the top. You know, I was like, here, take, you know, ask me anything. What do you need to know? And and even now we still talk and, and you know, I'll try to help her out. And, and she she actually helps me out a lot of times as far as wow. um, getting out of my head, as far as being in the studio for eight hours a day by myself. You know? Well, what do you th- what do you think makes a good student? Um, basically leaving your ego at the door. Whatever your ego is, you know, I, mine was pretty humbling. You know, when I first got to college, I was, I had a really, I had a big ego because I was the best in my high school. And then I realized, oh crap, everybody's the best in their high school here. And you know, <laughs> the, and the then, bar just got raised. Yeah. Yeah. The bar, yeah. you know, I was quite humbled. And so I said, okay, I need to, I'm here to learn. I'm not here to show off. I, I need to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to a certain point. And then personally, I just keep moving that goal on a little further back, you know, to keep me going um, again. So I don't become complacent, um, but leaving my, you know, realizing that early on that, you know, you're, you're just one of many and you're good, but you know, you've, got plenty to go. So one area I see that your work ethic really comes out strong too is, uh, is just the way you make a living. You've been a professional artist for many years. When did you start going full time as an artist? Uh, Full time was (laughs) the worst time to possibly go full time with anything was 2008. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) The mortgage breakdown, the meltdown. Yeah. Yeah. My, um, that was the same year I met my, well, I met my wife before that, but that was the same year that she and I both quit our jobs. Um, Good time to quit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) She was working at the Red Cross uh, doing graphic design for them in Ohio, and she quit, moved to Virginia to be with me. I was working at a warehouse on a forklift and a cherry picker for like eight hours a day. Oh. Yeah, along at VCU, and I quit. I quit the, the warehouse job, but kept teaching for a little while, and you know, just said, "Let's just make a run at this." And she started. She got a lot of uh, uh, applications out for teaching, and so she started teaching graphic design at a local school. And I had like my first gallery show in Richmond that was just fantastic. It was, it was a new gallery. They had just, I was like one of the first artists they signed based on actually some of my illustration work that they saw. And, you know, just, we just kept supporting each other and, and n- navigating our way through the relationship as well as being an in-house peer. I always like looking into a person's studio and their toolbox so if I walked yeah. into your studio in your workspace, what would I see? The studio, for the most part, is oddly cleaner than a lot of my friends' studios. Um, I'm, I, I don't consider myself to be a neat freak, but I like to know where things are when I need Organized, to find them. Organized, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a tool, a rolling tool chest that just has all my paint, rollers, brushes, uh, mediums. You know, and then I have a, a actual tool bag 
that is what I call my uh, magic murder kit. You know, if I needed to whoa, whoa, whoa. take care of something. Wait a minute. What, can, did, you, what did you call it? <laughs> I call it my magic murder box. Okay. I'm intrigued. <laughs> and it's, it's just a tote bag that has uh, every tool that I would possibly need if something were to happen to a painting while I'm on the road. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's my it's my fix it bag. So um, like one time I I uh, got the uh, a lady gave me the wrong dates for the workshop that I was teaching, and it, the the place was about an hour away, and I had about an hour and a half before when she told me the actual day, the correct day. So I ran back to my studio. The first thing I grabbed was my my magic murder box and. You know, threw it in the car, and that took care of everything that I needed for that workshop. So that was your go bag, your emergency go bag. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The only thing I need to do is like in the movies, like you know, put it in cement in the floor, and then you know, break it up when when I need it, like a real emergency. (laughs) Uh, You're the MacGyver of workshops. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Exactly. (laughs) But there's a, a. I mean, getting back to your question about the studio, there's a, there's, I have a TV in here. My wife has a printing press, like an old school printing press. There, there are three stations in the room. There's a tabaret for my daughter, a file cabinet with a tabletop on, on it for my wife. She does encaustic painting. My side of the studio, which has my, like two easels and my desk, um, mm-hmm. they like have paperwork and, all the kind of stuff I try to ignore. It's a little 600 square foot building about 20 feet off of the house. So I have a long commute. It's you know, killer. These, these you harsh are. Georgia winters. <laughs> and all that traffic in Hey Hira. <laughs> yeah. yeah right. <laughs> I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the space that I have because it took a long time to get here because when my wife and I first moved in together, we had a two bedroom apartment and the, um, the, the second bedroom was our office slash studio. So, you know, and that room might've been 10 by 10 foot. And so, you know, each time we we've moved like three times, this is our third move and this is our last move. And, each time we kind of upgrade it to, we'd save our pennies and all that stuff and upgrade it to a, a more art artist-friendly uh, house. Well, very nice. So what do you what do you like to paint with? What me, You're primarily oil paints, I know, but what, what do you yeah. like to paint with and what kind of surfaces uh, do you like to paint on? I've been using a combination of Gamblin as far as my oil paints and Lucas brand um, paints, which is a, I believe it's a German brand that I can get. I usually get those because the quality is good, but the price is also a little bit less than, than some of the major brands. I have been painting on my surface and, and materials. Uh, my surface has been aluminum dye bond for like the past close to 12 years now. So I've been, I've been painting on metal for most of my, my, uh, landscapes and and but the artist still retains the copyright to that work i get that it's a serious it's almost directly on the metal it, there's no there's no other surface mounted to it okay. what i have to do which is a lot more than um a lot of artists will go through it's a sheet of aluminum dye bond and i will scuff sand it uh just to get the plastic coating off and then i will coat that with uh, Sherwin Williams DTM bonding primer. Right. The the DTM stands for direct to metal. Yes. So it really adheres to that metal, and then I can put some gesso on top of that. What kind of gesso? Um, Are you just regular acrylic gesso, or do you do? A, yeah. 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 Regular acrylic gesso. Usually it's a uh, what is it? Liquitex or yeah. golden? Yeah. I kind of switch between the two. I had a. a Teacher, actually, Peter Fiore told me that his uh, the the chair of his department when he graduated the the his his graduation speech was keep your overhead low and your brushes clean. There you go. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try not to get too obsessive about it, but I do experiment with different surfaces. And yeah. I got this, I got this crazy idea the other day. Well, actually it wasn't the other day. I, it was, it's been some time back. I had bought raw linen. Mm -hmm. I thought I want to, I want to work this myself, just see what's involved from sizing and yeah. priming it and putting a ground on it, attaching it to a, uh, in this case, I was using a gator board. Uh -huh. Yeah, I won't do it again. <laughs> it's a lot. I will never buy raw linen again. It is a lot of work. <laughs> it is. I'm still, I, st I mean, it's an interesting surface. It, right. You know, I, but I would never do that again. I just go ahead and buy the, the prime linen or a, right. And a lot of times I like to paint on a surface, like hardboard, directly. Uh, yeah. So kind of like what you're doing I with dye bond. On, I used to, I, and sometimes I'll still paint on linen um, when it's a larger painting that, you know, yeah. I know that I need to ship. But for the most part, it's the, the dye bond sheets because I can get, you know, they're almost idiot proof in terms of sending them to the galleries. You know, nothing's going to cut the lift or something oh ghastly like that do you have to put a support behind them or is it you don't have to yeah uh, especially i mean if you're just going to frame it in a traditional frame you don't have to put a support behind it i used to um just for aesthetics um because i was also putting the uh paintings in floater frames so i needed to have a little bit of depth to them and i would i would just paint it like it was a canvas gallery wrap sure. so that um Folks had the option if they didn't want the floater frame, they could take it out and, you know, still paint on all the edges. Do you paint? What's the largest size paintings do you do? Nowadays, I mean, the largest have been like 48 by 60, but you know, good size, if I have yeah. an excuse to go bigger, I'll go bigger. Whatever will fit through that door. <laughs> so we talked about the materials. So let's talk a little bit about process. How, how do you begin so, your paintings there? Okay, so my process for the most part has started to change a little bit. Mm. Um, I'm going back to more so the way I used to do with illustrations, a lot of thumbnails. And I'll even take it into, you know, take the thumbnails onto my iPad and use Procreate and do some color studies through that. That's something that I picked up from David Dibble. You know, I, I have a little uh, tablet holder that will... Uh, I can attach to my easel, and so I can see my my study as I'm going. Um, but I don't. I, I've never really toned my my canvas or board. Um, I just start throwing paint on there just to get it covered. And a lot of times I'll start with the the brayer. You know, it might be like a inch and a half to three inches uh, of a brayer. I'll just mix the general the big masses of, of the colors that I need and just roll it on like I'm painting a wall in, wow. in my house. So, so you're blocking in with the brayer? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I just, I, it, it takes, there are less brush strokes, yeah, less brush strokes. Um, <laughs> there's no brush strokes for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's none. It's just rolling it on. It goes on nice and flat. And so the flatter the paint is, the quicker that's going to dry as well. Um, I'll still mix medium into my paint to, to help that along. And luckily, you know, being in Georgia, with the exception of like the past couple of days, everything dries quickly with yeah. the heat. Yeah, and I, I'm just kind of like a bull in the china shop with, with the painting. I just start big and just slowly go down to smaller, smaller brushes. And that's, you know, uh, I don't use any mineral spirits in my studio just because years ago I had an accident where <laughs> I was in Ohio. I had to move the studio inside because the three season room was, it's just too cold. And I got a fire going in, in the den. I had my paints. And I tried out this new chair, like folding portable chair that I was going to take to my workshops. So I had my easel. I had my table with my, my medium spirits and paint on it. And I, put, I sit down on a chair, and the chair collapses underneath. Oh, no. 
my hand goes back, it hits the table, flies up into the air, and gets maybe a foot away from the fireplace. And I, I'm just, first of all, my, my, my pride and ego are just shot because a chair just snapped underneath me. Um, <laughs> and I'm looking at how far away the, the fireplace was and how close that was to being something serious. Now, that was part of the reason I changed, you know, I stopped using mineral spirits. But the other part was just the, the general fumes. And, you know, my, my wife has like a super sniffer. Uh, so even though Gamsol is odorless, it's um, still there. It's still in the air. It's still there. Yeah. So I've been using coconut oil and olive oil just to clean my brushes in between colors. And that's it. And I, otherwise I use a, a medium from gambling, um, the solvent free fluid for, to mix into the paints. Now there's one, yeah. th- there's one other thing about your paintings I want to mention before we, we uh, close out the show. The titles for your paintings show a lot of thought. I like I like the titles to your paintings. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I, poets may not like me saying this, but poets only have words. An artist has both an image and words if they choose to use the words. Yeah. And you choose yeah. to use the words. <laughs> I, I realized a while ago that, you know, words matter. Therefore, titles matter. And, um... Also, being in different galleries, I couldn't, I didn't want the, the, the location of the painting to be set in stone as far as, hey, this, is, this painting was at mile marker 31, you know, on right. 75, and this is the only place it can be, uh, you know, because you know, I'll get a lot of collectors and, and art lovers who will just come by and say, this reminds me of dot, 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 this place. And I don't want to tell them it's not, or I don't want to shatter their, 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 uh, memory, you know, that, or the feeling that it gives them by saying, no, it's not there. You got it wrong. That, that, that would just be kind of taking a a good moment for them and and slamming it. (laughs) So you, you want to leave enough ambiguity so that they can fill in the rest of the story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, in a in a business sort of way, I want to be able to move it from, I want to be able to move that painting from you know Washington State to Washington D.C. and not have any real problem as far as oh yeah, this is Georgetown, I, you know, right. yeah, unless I'm sending it specifically to Georgetown in D.C., I don't want to name it that. You know, the titles sometimes take longer than the paintings take. <laughs> Do, do, do you have the title? So the title comes after the painting, or do you have the title yeah. before the painting? Uh, yeah. Every now and then, I'll have one that I'm just like, you know what? I already know it. I already know it. Uh, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I try to keep it pretty lighthearted. Well, uh, Stephen, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed talking with you today. Uh, this hour has gone by very fast for me. Uh, hopefully, it has yeah. for you as well. <laughs> no, it's been torture. Yeah. It's been absolute torture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy wouldn't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> well, no, it's been great. It's been great. Yeah. In all seriousness, it has been a, a real pleasure. I'm I'm happy that I got to know you a little bit better and uh, and was introduced to your work by by David Boyd earlier. So, yeah. um, uh, just beautiful work. Uh, your website is stephenwalkerstudios.com. That's Stephen with a V. Stephen with a V, not P. I always have to say that. So, Stephen, thank you so much for taking time to be on The Artful Painter. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Many thanks to Stephen Walker for taking the time to talk with me. I had a lot of fun with that discussion, and I hope you enjoyed it too. I also want to take the time to thank David Boyd Jr. for introducing me to the work of Stephen Walker. By the way, be sure to check out Stephen Walker's website. I include a link in the show notes. But he also appears, one of his paintings appears in the latest issue, the December 2020, January 2021 issue of Southwest Art 
on page 61. So congratulations uh, to Stephen for being in that magazine. Very nice. I want to take a moment to share some of the feedback and emails that I've received. Uh, the first one uh, really resonated with me. This is from Michelle Stanley Morgan. She says, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say how much I enjoy the podcast. I stumbled across it recently, and it's fantastic. I live in the UK, and once again, we find ourselves in lockdown. And as a recent returner to art, painting has really been my savior. I love how authentic and relaxed your conversation is with your guest. I particularly have loved hearing how we all face the same struggles, particularly on the easel, but how that translates in life and vice versa. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, Michelle, thank you for your kind words there. And I get it. I understand that feeling that you have regarding lockdown. While technically where I live, uh, there are no laws mandating a lockdown. My wife and I have chosen to lock down <laughs> uh, for our protection, for our family protection, and for our elderly parents' protection, as well as our, our friends. We we just feel that it's it's something that we need to take seriously and we do take every precaution that we possibly can, wearing masks, uh, disinfecting things. Uh, we rarely get out. Uh, we order groceries rather than go into the store whenever, uh, wherever it's possible to do that. So, uh, yeah, I get it. It's And it's frustrating. But uh, art can be an outlet for that. But I think, too, I just kind of put this in perspective. I got this email early this week, and I think it was Tuesday morning, a couple of days before I'm recording this, I called uh, a local hospital ICU unit to check on a friend of ours that has COVID. And I could tell that the nurse was very stressed and tired just from the tone of her voice. So I just asked her, I said, how are you doing? How are you coping? And she just broke down. I mean, she was in tears. Um, they work very long hours they don't have all that they need to do the work that they do. And they're frustrated by the attitude that people have toward this hideous and uh, deadly uh, disease. Um, she says they endure and go through the emotional, emotional turmoil of seeing at least one person a day die and sometimes more. And that's in a small local hospital. So you can just imagine the stress. And they don't get to have this outlet. You know, where we're locked down, whether that's imposed by law or self-imposed, they don't have that privilege of having the time to have a release like painting or some other outlet that could relieve, relieve the, the pressure, the stresses. So uh, I just really, my heart goes out to these ones. I just, <laughs> I wish there was something I could do, but... Uh, the only thing I could do in this case was just to say, you know, we really appreciate uh, what you're doing and what your team is doing. I don't know how you feel. I, d I don't know what it's like to be under that kind of pressure, but I, I recognize that it's a, it's a big deal for you and, and we care about you. And uh, she expressed appreciation for that. And so it, it put things in perspective uh, to me. I, you know, I can lament being locked down, but it could be far worse. And uh, eventually, just like other pandemics in world history, they do subside and they do go away. So meanwhile, we cope, we adjust, and we move on. And so my next email comes from Karen Werner. She says, hi, Carl, I just listened to the podcast with DK Pelichek. My ears and cackles went up when she started talking about the value of copying other people's paintings. She did casually mention that if you do copy a work, you can never show it. I think many beginning and amateur painters need to be made clearly aware that any copy of a living person's artwork or photograph is a violation of copyright laws unless the copier has gotten permission from the, from the living artist. Recently, two different amateurs have copied my work and put the copies on social media. I contacted them and they took it down. There are many worse stories of copying than mine. This is a sore subject for many accomplished American artists who have found online their duplicated work being sold in Russia, China, etc. I would love it if you would, in a future podcast, reiterate that if you copy, you can never show it anywhere, sell it, or duplicate it. 
How about having a podcast with a copyright attorney? Thank you for your consideration, Karen Warner. Uh, Karen, thank you uh, very much for writing uh, a topic which you are clearly passionate about. Uh, I'm not going to address it in this podcast. At this time, I'm going to do a YouTube video in the near future on this very topic. But what I would like to do is ask my listeners, what's your take on this situation with copyright law uh, and copying a living uh, artist's work for personal use and, and so forth? Have you had any problems with copyright violations? What kind of uh, situations have you run into and how did you handle it? So what you can do is you can contact me through uh, my contact form on my website, carlolson.tv slash contact. And just drop me your notes there. Drop me your experience. I'd like to hear from everyone about this particular topic before I develop a video on it. Uh, you know, she did say, well, what about having a podcast with a copyright attorney? Uh, no, that's not going to happen. And not because I don't care, but it's because my podcast is The Artful Painter. It is a artist interview podcast. So I only interview artists. However, I have other ways to express this. And like I said before, I'll address this in a YouTube video. So Karen, thank you for bringing up this sensitive topic. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our listeners, uh, their experiences with this particular matter. And now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my associate producers. These are people who provide financial support to The Artful Painter with their generous donations. And today I have yet another new associate producer to announce. This is John Bradham from Washington. John, thank you so very much for your fine support. He sent me an email in connection with this, which I really appreciated. He says, keep up the good work, Carl. I love the podcast. I listen to it while painting and appreciate your taste in artists and the high production value. And he did provide me a link to his artwork. It's John, J-O-N uh, Bradham. That's B-R-A-D-H-A-M.com. Beautiful artwork there. Go check it out. I'll have a link in the show notes uh, to his website. So John, thank you so very much for your generous uh, donation and thank you for sharing your website. I really appreciate it when my listeners do that in their emails or their contributions or whatever. It, it brings me pleasure to be able to uh, get the word out about uh, what you're doing as a painter. So that brings up the number of associate producers for the year 2020 to 24. Cynthia Agatha, Agatha Cleus, Kelly Bailey, Alan Bloom, John Bradham, John Calabrese, Beth Cole, Sandra Shook, Jeffrey Eichhoff, Scott Hegelson, Richard Husband, Priya Gore, Brent Kimber, Deborah Martin, David McNeil, Jonathan McPhillips, uh, Jim McVicker, Margaret Miller, Debbie Mueller, uh, Cheryl Petty, Jill Rifato, Serena Stratford, Frank Wash, Colleen White, and Shirley Williams. Thank you. Thank each and every one of you. I deeply appreciate it. If you'd like to join my growing ranks of associate producers, all you have to do is go to carlwilson.tv and click on the donate tab. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of The Artful Painter. Hopefully before 2020 is over, I'll squeeze in one more episode. I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. I'm going to try. I'll try to get you one more episode after this one, okay? And I think you'll enjoy it just as much as you, as you have enjoyed this one today. So thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next edition of The Orful Painter.